we have exactly 15 days um, until we get on a bus to Lake Havasu, which is just crazy to think about. Two weeks away, um, only Adam's excited, I guess. Um, but uh, going to Havasu uh, every year, um, it brings me back uh, because as a student, when I was your uh, age, um, I was going to Lake Havasu for revival myself as a camper. And uh, so anytime I get to go back to that cove, anytime I get to go back to that hotel uh, there on the beach, uh, anytime I get to go to the infinity pool, which that infinity pool was not there uh, when I first started going to revival. Um, it was a recent addition. But anyway, every time I pull up to that property, um, I start to feel a little bit nostalgic um, because I was in your shoes. I was getting off the bus and getting my team jerseys. I was getting off the bus and, and starting to do the chants myself and get involved in the games. And specifically, the games at Revival have stayed more or less, stayed pretty much the same over the years. They're kind of the same games, little adaptations here and there. Um, and so Steal the Bacon, Hunger Games, all those things, I played those uh, when I was your age. And Steal the Bacon uh, was something that has, uh, it's been around for a long time, and uh, it was one of my favorite games. And uh, I, I was kind of, at Revival, I was kind of the guy that was more into the games than the other things. Uh, sometimes, well, at least until I became a Christian, I guess. Um, then that changed a little bit, um, or a lot bit. But uh, I was into the games. So, I, uh, you know, sports, I like to play sports. And so, um, not looking at me, you think I'm an athlete. But I like to play it. I'm coordinated. I'm pretty fast in the water. I can run relatively fast. Um, and uh, all the games with balls, I was, I was relatively good at. And so I loved playing the games. And uh, I was pretty good, seventh and eighth grade. Um, I was not that small. And then there was this transition that every eighth grade going on ninth grader goes, where you go from junior high revival to high school revival. And a lot of things change, okay? So I made it to high school. Um, I probably... I don't really remember my exact weight, but I think I had just made it over 100 pounds. But I was like 5'8". So like 100 pounds stretched out into 5'8". Like that was just straight skin and bones. Um, and so, I, again, I was relatively fast. I could swim well, but like not super, super strong. And uh, so anyway, I was going into my freshman year pretty confident. Like, you know, I, I know these guys are bigger than me. They're probably faster than me. They're probably more muscular than me. But you know what? It's fine. I can, I can beat them. I could do it. And so I go into my freshman year kind of confident. And I will tell you this, we were playing Steal the Bacon, and I'll never forget this moment where I, uh, I made it out there first, I got a tube, um, I, I saw this big guy um, who was right in front of my cone, and I kind of hit him with the Euro step, like I, like I had the tube, and then I just, he missed, uh, like I, he, I juked him out, so he's like behind me, I get to my cone, and the tube gets stuck on my, on my shoulder, and so like I'm trying to get it off, and like I, I couldn't get it off. I just, I flat out missed it. There's a video of this, actually. I tried to find the video. I couldn't find it. Um, but anyway, it gets stuck on my shoulder. I miss it. And so this big guy, probably 280, probably 6'6", something like that. He was bigger than Adam. And I am, I'm a, like, he, his, his name was, his nickname was Chief, okay? And this guy was a, this guy was a big, big dude. And uh, so he's bigger than Adam. I'm 5'8", maybe 95 pounds. And this guy, he grabs my tube and starts to flip me around like a, like a fish, you know, like you catch, catch a fish, it's flopping around. Like he's just flying me all over the place, trying to get me off the tube. And I was like, man, this is my tube. Like I almost made it. And this guy, he, like his team was on one side. Uh, my cone was right here. I was right here on my cone. The dude just, when he realized he was not getting me off the tube, he was just like, okay, that's fine. And so he just literally grabs the tube with like one arm, like a bicep curl, and just drags me across the entirety of the beach. And so my skin and bones body in front of everyone on the 100 and probably 50 degree sand just gets dragged and everyone's like, look at this little kid, like little freshman, like, oh, cute. Like just absolutely embarrassed in front of everyone at Revival. And I tell you this story not to freak you uh, now ninth graders out because I'll just say this, I was there too. We, we, all, we all got to experience it. Um, and so I was, I was right there in your shoes. And so it's okay. Um, but I'm telling you this story because you can, if you'd like to, you can just let go of the tube. Like you don't have to be the laughing stock of the camp because some, you know, 6'6", six, six, 280 pound football player drags you across the sand. You don't have to experience that. You can let go. Again, this guy was bigger than, bigger than Adam. Can you imagine Adam, like, dragging, like, bigger than even him. So anyway, 
you, you don't have to hang on. Like, you can let go. You can keep your dignity. Uh, you don't have to be embarrassed by the girl that you like sitting there watching you get dragged across the beach. Like, you don't have to experience that if you don't want to. You can learn from my humbling experience, and you can avoid that if you want. You don't have to, but if you want to. I think when we learn experiences from other people, we see something bad go on to someone else. A, a humbling experience for someone else who, again, going in, I was feeling pretty confident. Going in, when they get humbled, you as a bystander, you as someone watching that can say, you know what, I'm going to either learn from that example or I'm just going to do the exact same thing and experience the exact same humbling process. I'd like you guys to open up to Mark chapter 10 where we're going to see a very similar story to that. Where we're going to see two guys, two of the disciples, James and John, get frankly embarrassed in front of the other ten disciples. And now thousands of years later, in front of you too. And I think this is helpful for us to see. This is what it looks like for you to learn from their example of selfishness and pride. To make sure that you don't get humbled the same way that they did. They were very overconfident. They were very selfish disciples who got a little too big for their britches and Jesus humbled them in front of the other ten and now in front of us to the church thousands of years later. Now, there, this story is written in the Bible and uh, at least Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I think it's one for you to learn from, watching them be humbled to say, you know what, I'm going to avoid their mistakes. I'm going to make sure that I don't act like them. I'm going to not be selfish. I'm not going to be prideful. I'm not going to think too highly of myself but put those things to death and humble myself under the master, humble myself under Jesus so that he might glorify me rather than me trying to glorify myself. Mark chapter 10. Let's look at verses 35 to 45. These 11 verses looking at James and John and really a really embarrassing story of them. So let's pick it up here. Verse 35, Mark chapter 10, verse 35. It says this, it says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came up to Jesus and they said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And so Jesus then said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. For are you able to drink uh, the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to him, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or to my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those uh, for whom it has been prepared. And when the other ten, they heard it, they, were, they became indignant. They became angry at James and John. And Jesus called, to them, uh, called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, over the people that are under their authority. And it says, and the great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. For whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This story is a story about selfishness, and it's a story about pride. And it's a story about two men who were so selfish and so prideful asking Jesus, the, the, the God-man, the Son of God, the Messiah, a really, really dumb question. And it's a question that we can learn from thousands of year, years later to make sure that we don't do this. If you pick it up here in the um, beginning, or the, sorry, the middle rather, of Mark chapter 10, if you actually look your eyes just up one episode, one, one paragraph, you see the context in which this question is taking place. Jesus pulls his disciples aside and he's about to tell, or he does tell them in verses 32 through 34, that Jesus, he himself, he said, I am going to go to the cross. I am going to die. I'm going to die on the cross and I'm going to rise again. And instantly, these guys are just thinking about what they want. And then they go and they ask this really dumb request to be able to sit at Jesus' right and left hand. A, 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 a request of pride and a request of selfishness. And so when we see any episode of a, of a little brother or a sister, or you see an episode even in your own life, or an episode here in the Bible of someone being selfish and prideful, it should help you look in the mirror at yourself and say, I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to be prideful. I want to learn from this example and be disgusted by it. So point number one, I'd like you to write it down this way if you're taking notes. Point number one, be disgusted by your selfishness and pride. This is a 
disgusting example of selfishness and pride. Important for you to look in your own life and say, do I have selfishness? Do I have pride? Because if you do, which I know every single person in this room listening to my voice does, including myself, we ought to look in the mirror and be grossed out by it. This story, it's kind of a, it's kind of a gross one. It's kind of embarrassing. It's like, what are you guys doing? Verse 35, it says they come up to him, James and John, they come up to Jesus and listen to the sentence. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Do you think that's any way to talk to Jesus? Like Jesus, the son of God. They say, Jesus, do whatever we want you to do. Like that's, that's pretty prideful. That's pretty selfish. And their request is even more selfish. And they have so much, um, use a big word, presumption, where they feel so into themselves and they feel like they can say and do whatever they want to Jesus. Now imagine yourself right now as one of the 12 disciples walking around with Jesus. Do you think you would go to Jesus and tell him, Jesus, do whatever I want you to do. Do what I want you to do. I, I, I don't think any of us probably would say that. But I think a lot of us might say that in our prayer lives. Bow your heads and pray, God, give me this. God, give me that. I want this. I want to avoid this. I want this test grade. I want this sports team. I want this. God, give it to me. Do you see how the same dripping pride and selfishness that the James and John had can be the same pride and selfishness that can show up in your life, in your relationship with Jesus, where you view him as someone to get stuff out of? They're saying, Jesus, give me what I want. Treating Jesus as though he is you know, the genie from Aladdin to say, no, you, you are someone that is going to grant me my wishes. I, I have a relationship with you so that I can get something out of you, so that you can give me something. They view Jesus so low, so small, in that he's really just a vending machine to them. He's just the, the waiter to say, come give me this. And James and John, if you know anything about James and John, is they were actually very, uh, they were very fiery personalities, where they, were, uh, they would get very angry very quickly. They would get very zealous and ambitious very quickly. Uh, there was a time when uh, Jesus was uh, preaching, and some people rejected uh, Jesus, and they asked Jesus, they said, hey, uh, uh, Jesus, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy those people over there? Do you want us to do that? Like, that's the kind of guys that these, these two men were. They were quick on, uh, they, they had a, uh, very quick to make decisions. They, they, would, they would get excited. They would get um, intense about certain things. And in this way, they got really intense about their own desires. Look at this. Teacher, give, uh, we want you to do for us. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And so the Jesus says, okay, what do you want me to do for you? Verse 36. And then verse 37, here's the request. It says, and they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in glory. What they're saying here is, Jesus, I want you to give us power. I want you to give us authority. I want you to give us this place in heaven where people are going to look up to us and say, man, those guys are, are awesome. Those guys are so powerful. Those guys are so great. Jesus, give that, give that to me so that when people see me, they, they, they have a high view of me, a, a good, a high reputation of me. Which, again, this sounds like such a, such a petty request. But I think it's a, an eye-opening one for us to make sure that we don't view Jesus the same way. Jesus, give me what I want. Jesus, make my life better. Or some of you view Jesus as, I'm going to have a relationship with Jesus so that he can give me stuff, so that my life can be better. I've heard that if you have life without Jesus, it's bad. If you have life with Jesus, it's good. So therefore, I just don't want a bad life. I just want a good life. And so I'm going to be a friend of Jesus so that he can give me what I want. It's a very wrong view of Jesus. It's a very wrong view of the gospel. It's a very wrong, view, uh, low view of Jesus where we were just sitting here a moment ago, standing here a moment ago, singing, Jesus, you alone, you are the high, you are lifted up, you are glorious. And so therefore, I want to worship you. Do you sing a song like that and then you go out and you live your week like those songs don't really matter, like you don't really believe those? Do you live your life as, no, you know what, I'm going to just pray today and I'm just going to pray that God just give me what I want. Give me what I want. Give me what I want. Give me authority. Give me power. Give me reputation. Give me stuff. God, just give me stuff. James and John 
are examples for us to look at and say, oof, I don't want to be like them. I want to be actually far away from them. Their request is so self-serving to make their life better. And specifically in, in glory that people would, would come before them as authorities forever and ever. It's a really gross look at the vanity of man's heart. Think about it like this. You see those people that whenever they see a nice like sports car on the side of the road or something like that, they go and they take a picture with it. You, you, ha- you have those people on your Instagram or you know, maybe you know those people. Maybe you are those people. Um, don't be those people um, because what are you doing when someone says, hey, here's my phone. Uh, can you can take a picture with me with this car? You're going to post it on your Insta or whatever, and, and you're going to post it so that people think it's your car, right? Oh, hey, check out, check out my whip. Like, this is mine. Like, it's, it's, the w- it's such a weird flex because everyone knows that's not your car. Like, everyone knows that's not your car. But someone will say, take a picture of me in front of this car so that all of my followers will look at me and think I'm great. So that all of my followers will look at me and think that I'm rich. So all my followers would think this is my car and I'm, 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 I'm an important person. Their request right here of Jesus is give us something so that everyone else looks at us and thinks that we're important. Thinks that we're a big deal. See, Jesus doesn't answer this request. He doesn't answer this request because it's a bad request. It's a selfish request. It's a self-centered request. Write this one down, James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. James 4, 2 and 3 says this. It's talking about prayer, talking about asking God of things. And it says, you desire, you want things, but you don't have them. And so you go do bad things like murder. You covet, you covet other people's stuff and you can't get it, you can't obtain it. So instead you just fight and quarrel with each other. You've got desires that are unmet is the idea. It says you do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, referring to prayer, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. What these two verses are saying here is that everyone in this room has desires, selfish desires. And if you have these selfish desires and you let them linger in your life, and you look around and you covet other people's stuff, or you look around and you, 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 you uh, murder is, is the idea, which I, I don't think anyone is tempted to murder this week. But the idea is you, you murder someone because they have something that you don't have, or you're angry at them, or you want to I- inflict justice upon them. And so you, you have a desire, it's not met, and so you go do something wrong. You, you steal, you fight, you quarrel, or you murder. And it says you've got these selfish desires, and it says those who go before God and ask for them, they don't receive those requests because they ask, to, they ask these requests that are, that are selfish. And as you look at your prayer life, maybe, and you think about the requests that you go before God, that you go uh, with, uh, before God with, what kind of requests are they? Are they selfish requests that, God, give me what I want? I mean, think about it. So you, some of you go and pray and you ask, God, give me this, give me this, give me this. Do you see this picture of James and John and how ridiculous they look, how selfish they look, how prideful they look? And not just how they look, but actually how selfish and prideful they were. How does someone go before God and demand things of God, selfishly speaking? It's because they've got a heart of selfishness. And so if you think right now about your desires, your selfish, or your, your desires you go before God and ask, I want you to evaluate, even today, are my desires that I have, are they selfish? And do I go before God with those desires? Asking God for things to make my life better, or to make me more important. This heart of selfishness, of, of self-serving requests, it's, just, it's not going to get them anything. And Jesus, he answers it that way. He says, I'm not going to give you that. He says, verse 38, look back at the text. He said, Jesus said to them, he says, you do not know what you're asking. Why? Because are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we're able. And Jesus said to him, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But for it is for those for whom it has been prepared. What is Jesus saying here? What's he trying to communicate? He's trying to communicate to them that a disciple, a real disciple of Jesus is someone that is not worried about themselves, is not worried about selfishness and pride, is not worried about their own request. But it says here that they're worried about God's uh, will. What I mean by that, I'll I'll get to that in a moment. You can write down Philippians 2.21. 
you, you're, you're the one of these two people. Philippians 2.21 says you can either seek your own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. The idea here of this verse is to pit these two things against each other. If your life revolves around you and your request and your desires, the reminder is for you that this is not the desires of Jesus. What does he say here? What is the drinking cup and what is the baptism? What is he talking about? Well, Jesus is trying to show them that they don't understand what it means to be a disciple. They don't understand what it means to have, uh, the, 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 the he's trying to expose to them that they are selfish. And he's trying to say that if you're a disciple, you're actually going to be someone that is going to do things that you don't want to do. The idea of to drink a cup is not really like an actual like physical cup with liquid in it. But the idea of drinking uh, the cup is this, is this Old Testament picture of drinking the wrath of God, experiencing God's wrath. And to be baptized here is not the baptism that we just experienced over there in the other room. Uh, if you were there in first service and heard these people get baptized. The idea of putting, uh, drinking the cup and baptism, those two things together, is this idea of suffering. That drinking God's wrath and being baptized is the idea of, of being immersed, being overcome with it. And so re- really what Jesus is trying to communicate here, he's trying to say, you will suffer and you will die just like me. Are you able to, to are you willing to be able to, to die and to suffer alongside of me. If you know anything about the disciples, once Jesus leaves, they go out and they preach the gospel, and then they go out and they do die. James was actually one of the first of the disciples uh, to die, and John was the last disciple to die. He was exiled onto the island of Patmos, and he writes Revelation there later in the first century. But James was one of the first people to be executed. He was executed by having his head cut off before the, in, with the, the Romans cutting his head off for being a Christian, for standing up for, for Jesus. So what Jesus is doing here in this passage, he's trying to prepare them to say, you're asking for selfish things. Hey, guys, you, you don't even understand what it means to be a disciple. There's going to be some big suffering, some big things that are going to come down the pipeline for you. You don't need to turn there, but write down John 15, 18 through 20. Jesus talks to his disciples at the end of his life. Um, the Last Supper, he has this conversation with them, and he says, if the world hates you, and know that the world hated me first. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world is going to hate you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master, for if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Jesus is trying to explain to them that they need to stop with their selfishness and pride because ultimately they are going to experience suffering for being a disciple. Going back to what I said just a moment ago, some of you in this room think being a disciple of Jesus means I am going to go from the bad life and I'm now going to experience the good life. Jesus reverses that in this, in this response here. He says to be a disciple means you are going to suffer you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer people mocking. You're going to suffer isolation from the rest of the world. And for these disciples, it says you're going to even experience death. What does that have to do with selfishness and pride? It's a reminder of what is a big deal and what is a small deal. They're asking for a really small deal. God, give me stuff to make my life better, to make my uh, eternity better, where people will now come before my throne. He's saying, you guys don't even understand at all. To be a disciple means you are going to experience, not you shouldn't be uh, living a life of selfishness, but you're going to experience suffering instead. Look at verse 41. It says, when the ten, when they had heard this, he says, they became indignant. The idea of being indignant is that they got really, really angry at James and John. Can you imagine that for a minute? Just play this story out. You're one of the other ten disciples. And you hear James and John, who were some of the closest disciples to Jesus, they go, up to Je- they go up to Jesus and they say, God, give me a throne in heaven so that I can rule over everyone else. And the other 10 people are sitting there listening to this. Like, you know, uh, uh, imagine it's like, uh, again, trying to think like, you're at CSM and everyone's here. And then someone gets up and says, Pastor Matt, like, can I be your favorite student? And can you give me everything that you have? Like, everyone else is, like, sitting here listening to it. And you're like, it's super awkward. Like, why are you asking that in front of everyone else? Because what does everyone else probably want? I mean, probably not. I don't know if everyone wants to be my favorite student. But, like, like oh, wait, no, I, I'd like power. I would like stuff. I would like authority. And so everyone else, they get upset. And they're like, what are you, what are you asking this for? And they're upset. 
And if you think right now about your selfishness, I'm sure you can think of many examples in your life when you've been selfish in your life and other people have been upset at you for it. Think about it, you know, like you're, you steal uh, something from your sibling. You, it's just you're five years old, you steal a toy from your sibling. Then all of the other siblings are mad at you because you stole their toy. Because you are being selfish, you are being prideful. Other people will come against you if you're being selfish and prideful. But I want you to see this in verse 42, Jesus' response. He pulls them all together, all 12 of them, and he says this. Because he, he understands that everyone's mad at one another. And he says, verse 42, he says, Jesus said, uh, called them to him and he said to them this. He says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles... They lord it over them, and, the, uh, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. What Jesus does here is he says, you guys, talking about your selfishness, talking about your pride, I want you to first take a look at the rest of the world and how they treat leadership and how they treat authority and how they treat pr- power. It says that the Gentiles, when they get power, the rulers of the Gentiles, look at this verb here. This is one word in in the Greek, lord it over them. The idea is that they are the authority, and now they're being overly authoritative with everyone else under them, where they abuse their power. You think of that in world history, like if you studied, you know, these dictators, Hitler and Mussolini and all these like really bad dictators. How did they get that way? They got a little bit of power. And then they got a little bit more, and then they got a little bit more, and then they got a little bit more, and then they got a little bit more. And when they had all of this power, they took advantage of it, and they took advantage of people. And they hurt people, and they destroy people, and they, they make people feel bad. Or, in Hitler's case, kill people. So what does that have to do with selfishness and pride? Why is Jesus saying that? And maybe you're sitting here, and you're like, I, I don't even understand this sermon. Like, what, what are you talking about? I don't, I don't get it. What Jesus does here is he says, look out at the world. Look how selfish and prideful they are. And he says, you, disciple, you, person that call yourself a Christian, don't be like them. Do I have to explain to you at school? Do I have to explain how selfish people are at school? Do I have to explain to you how prideful the people in your class are? Probably not. You probably see it every single day and it's gross to you. When you see that, when you see your friends be that way and be selfish and prideful, you, if you're calling yourself a disciple, should say, that is not, that is the exact opposite of what my master calls me to do. I need to be as far different from those people as I possibly can. Listen to the way that Paul describes the end of the world, describes people of this world. He says this, 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 4, he describes all these different sins that the people Uh, that the the people of the world will do. And all of these sins are examples of selfishness and pride. I highlighted the ones that have something to do with selfishness or something to do with pride. It says, but understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self. That's prideful and selfish. Lovers of money. That's pretty selfish. Proud. That's prideful. Arrogant. That's prideful. Abusive. That's prideful and selfish. Disobedient to parents. That's prideful and selfish. Ungrateful. Unholy. Heartless unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. And listen to the punchline here that Paul gives to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, avoid such people. Be different from them. Separate yourself from them because they are not what God calls you to do as a disciple. Important question for me to ask you this morning. Are you? Do, do you, does your life look like the world? Do you act like your friends at school? Do you look any different? Do you act any different? Do you think any different? Are you any more humble than them? Are you any more selfless than them? Don't you dare call yourself a Christian, but you look exactly like all of your friends at school. Because guess what? You're not. You're not a disciple. Disciples look distinct. Disciples look different. Disciples look holy and set apart from the rest of the world. If you look like the world, you are not a disciple. He says that's what the Gentiles do. They lord it over them. And he says this, verse 43, but it shall not be so among you. You have to be different. And so instead of pride and selfishness, 
You've got to be humble and serve other people. Whoever will be great among you must be your servant. Whoever will be first among you must be a slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Point number two, write it down this way. Adopt the humble mindset of a disciple. Adopt the humble mindset of a disciple. Jesus corrects a thirst for power and a thirst for, for stuff. And he says, no, a disciple is someone that is going to be humble. It's going to humbly serve other people. What do you think of when you think of humility? Humility, you probably think of, uh, humility is just the opposite of pride. Pride is thinking you're so great. Humility is thinking you're so bad. These two things are just the opposite of each other. We looked at this, actually this slide actually might look familiar to, was back when we were studying Ephesians in um, chapter, um, the beginning of chapter 5, when it talked about us being humble, having humility. We talked about it this way. Does, it, does humility, biblical humility, is it for you to just think, well, I'm, I'm the worst. I, I'm, I'm the worst person. I, I'm the dumbest person. I'm the ugliest person. I, I'm, ju- I'm just the worst person. And so therefore, to be humble is to just have a really low view of myself. That's not what biblical humility is. Biblical humility is actually the opposite. Instead of focusing on yourself and how low and terrible you are, it's actually for you to just preoccupy your attention and thoughts with everyone else. Real biblical humility is looking at everyone else, not at myself. To say, oh, I'm the worst is you looking at yourself. And so pride and selfishness, those come to die where humility comes in. Humility says, what about other people? It starts with this mindset. It starts with thinking this way. And this humble mindset is one that you need to have to become a disciple. It's also the humble mindset that you need to have now as a disciple. I won't spend too much time on it, but we talked about this way back, uh, was that three weeks ago? The last time I was preaching here of, of when Jesus called his first couple disciples. Where they left everything and they followed Jesus. And so, therefore, a disciple is someone that understands that he is under his master and he must respond. He must obey his master. And so, sub point A, read on this way, take your orders from the master. Take orders from the master. This is the first way to have a humble mindset is you are not in charge anymore. You are not the boss anymore. But now you're taking your orders from the master. How can you be selfish? How can you be prideful if you truly thought every single day you know what? I am submitting my life to God. It's really hard to be selfish that way. You can be selfish if you're in charge, but you can't be selfish selfish if you're not in charge. If you're at the bottom of the totem pole, if you're the one taking orders from the master. And again, it starts with this mindset. You write down Romans 12, 3. It says, for by the grace that was given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think with sober judgment. The idea here is that you must not think of yourself as more important than you really are because the Bible says you are a disciple. You are under your master submitting yourself to him. And we don't have time to turn there, but you can write down what we looked at a couple weeks ago in Mark chapter 1, Mark 1, uh, verses 16 through 20. That was when he called Peter and Andrew, two brothers. And then if you remember that story, he also calls the sons of Zebedee, James and John. The same James and John that we have in our passage. Ten chapters later, they're asking, Jesus, give me power. Jesus, give me authority. But do you remember what Mark 1 said? Jesus says, hey guys, follow me. And it says, they just dropped their nets. They left everything. It says they even left their dad in the boat. And they said, peace out, dad. I'm going to go follow this guy now. That's humility. That's saying, I'm not the boss anymore. You're the boss. In our passage, they've forgotten that. They think that they're the boss and they can tell Jesus what to do. You've got to be humble every single day. James 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And then in James 4, 10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. James 4, 6 and James 4, 10. You must be humble. You and yourself under God. That is something that you can wake up every single day and you can think about. When your alarm clock goes off, and again, summer, it looks a little different, your schedules and everything. When your alarm clock goes off, what are you you thinking about? Your mindset every single day when you wake up in the morning, 
to say, how can I humbly submit myself to God? Genuinely, what if you thought about that tomorrow morning when you woke up? The alarm goes off and you think, how can I humbly submit to God today? What if that was actually what you thought about in the morning? Do you think that that would change your attitude? Do you think that would change your selfishness? Do you think that would change your pride? I think it absolutely would because it reminds you that you're not in charge anymore. God is. The master is. And your job is now to submit to him. Having that mindset every single day. And then what is the mindset that he tells you to have here in this passage? He says, verse 43, whoever be great among you must be your servant. Whoever be first among you must be a slave of all. He says you need to now serve other people. Sub point B, be a servant of others. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? You want to have sit at the right hand or left hand of Jesus? No, just serve everyone else is Jesus' solution. Be a servant of others. Humility. Counting others as more significant than yourselves. How can I serve others? Going back to what we just had on the screen a couple moments ago, biblical humility is worried about everyone else. A servant of everyone else is worried about everyone else except for myself. I'll be okay. I walk in a room like this and I say, I am everyone's servant here. Did anyone walk in with that mindset today? I'm the least important person in this room. My job is to help make everyone else here feel welcome. My job is to serve everyone here in this room. He says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, that's what you are called to do. That's what you're called to be. We looked at this back in Ephesians. This is a very short verse. Maybe you don't even remember this verse. But Ephesians uh, 5.21 Ephesians 5.21, not 4.21, 5.21 says this. It says that you're submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That was right before he says, wives, submit to your husbands. He says everyone needs to be submitting and deferring their own desires and preferences for other people. Doing that for everyone else. Ephesians 5.21. What does that other person want? How can I serve them? Not worried about what I want, but worried about them. Write this one down. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. We've looked at these two verses many times over the course of our how-to series in Ephesians. But Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says this. It says, do nothing. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Do you see how in verse 3 it says, in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves? Is that an action or is that a thought? That's a, th- that's a thought. That's a way of thinking. How can I view everyone else in here as more important than me? That's my job. And my job is to then therefore serve everyone here in this room. What were you thinking about when you walked into this room this morning? Where are my friends? What do I want to drink? And who's going to come up and talk to me? These three things probably popped up in your mind. Maybe the drink one. I don't know. Maybe you're just not into it. Maybe the two. We took away milk tea. Maybe you're upset about that. I don't know. Do you see how all three of those are all about me? How, are, how is my experience going to be? What can I get out of it? A humble person walks into this room and says, I'm looking at everyone else. Who, who can I serve today? Who can I bless today? Who can I encourage today? Who can I welcome today? Maybe I don't know that person. Maybe they're sitting by themselves. I'm going to go sit with them. I'm going to go be their friend because I'm worried about their interests more important than my own interests. Do you see yourself as a servant of others? Hopefully that's your reputation. Do your parents view you as a servant of others? What would your teachers say? What would your siblings Would they say that you are a servant of others? If not, then you've got some work to do this week. Serving your parents, serving your siblings, welcoming people at church. He says, slave of all. Not just the people I like, but all of them. Why? Look at verse 45. Close with this one. Verse 45, he says, for even the son of man, he's talking about himself here, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
he says here, he says, I am the example of humility. I am the example of service. Follow me. Subpoint C, model your humility after Jesus. Model your humility after Jesus. Model your humility after Jesus. Maybe you've heard this verse before. I've quoted this verse many times before. Son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The context of this statement, of what Jesus came to do, is in the context of you being humble, of you being selfless. And he says, I'm the example of that. Look at the way that I've done it. You can go do the exact same thing. I'd like you to turn over a couple pages to the right to Philippians chapter 2. We just looked at verses 3 and 4, but I want you to see Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8 with me. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. He's talking about selfish ambition. He's talking about counting to others that is more significant than yourselves. And this is the baseline that he uses, the foundation of this argument. He says this, Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 5. Philippians 2, 5. He says, have this mind. Think this way is what he's saying. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but Jesus, he emptied himself, going from heaven, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What did Jesus come to do? He came to give up his own life. Who was he before he came to planet Earth? He was reigning in heaven as the second member of the Trinity, as the Son of God. And it says he let that go. He did not count it a thing to be grasped, which means he said, instead of holding it, I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to empty myself, and I'm going to take the form of a human being, of a servant. Of all the people in this world that has ever lived, Jesus is the only one that did not need to come and serve anyone else. But you know what? He was the greatest example of the one who did serve everyone else. No one has served the world more than Jesus. And Jesus didn't need to. Jesus was God. Jesus is God. He let that go for a time, at least in his glorified state, so that he could serve other people. Imagine you're going into the bathroom at school. Again, school bathrooms are the worst. So just like you're trying to hold it till you get home, but you can't. And you go into the bathroom and there's someone cleaning the bathroom, and you look, and it's your principal, would you be, like, kind of shocked? Like, normally, you know, he's the guy in the tie, or, you know, she's in the nice, like, pantsuit or whatever. Like, we've got the janitors. What are you doing in the bathroom? The school bathroom is a sketchy place. Why are you here? It would be, it would be a weird experience because you would, you would say to yourself, wait a minute. This is, this, is, this is like the lowest place of school, and you're the highest position at school. You should, not, you should not be here. That's why they give principals their own bathrooms. That's why they've got the staff bathrooms, so that they don't have to go to the bathroom with you. They don't want to go to those places. Imagine your principal scrubbing the toilets at your school. It would be weird. What did Jesus come to do? Jesus is the ultimate authority stooping down to scrub the bathrooms, the lowest of low, so that you, a sinner, could go free so that you, a sinner, could be forgiven of your sin. He gives many examples. You probably know this one in John 13 where he scrubs the disciples' feet. He has so many examples, one after the other after the other. Look at how humble I am. Look at how much I've served you. And he says, go do the exact same thing. Look back at Philippians chapter 2. Look at what it says, uh, where Jesus goes from there. Verse 9, Philippians 2, 9, he says, therefore... God has exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Maybe you're sitting here right now thinking, you know what, I don't really want to be selfless. I don't really want to be humble. I'd rather be selfish and I'd rather be prideful because guess what, I've tried it before. It, it, I, it didn't really work out. It wasn't great. Jesus here is this reminder that if you humble yourselves under God, he sees every act of humility, every act of selflessness. And again, he rewards Jesus for his 
incredible act of selflessness by coming down and dying for us, by exalting him, the name is above every name, and he's going to be worshipped forevermore. Every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the glory of God the Father. Jesus is glorified and rewarded for his sacrifice. You will be too. Every act of selflessness that you do this week, when you feel convicted right now in the sermon, you're like, oh, I'm going to go be less selfish this week. If you do so, God will reward it. God sees every act of selflessness, every act of humility, every thought even too. It's good for us to reflect on this because we're a bunch of selfish, prideful people. We got it passed down from Adam and Eve. They were pretty selfish. They were pretty prideful. They took a bite of that fruit, and now we're all selfish and prideful. So because of that, we now have Jesus who is living inside of us, changing us day by day to look more like himself, to be more faithful disciples, more selfless, and more humble disciples. So I hope this week you walk as a disciple, as you walk as a real disciple, someone that is putting off the flesh, putting on righteousness, putting off pride, putting on humility, putting off selfishness, and putting on selflessness, because that's what he's called us to be, to not be like James and John, to learn from their example, and to be different. So let's bow our heads and pray right now, and we'll go out. Small groups this week are back. Talk more about it on Wednesday night. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, God, we do thank you for this reminder here, this gross, embarrassing reminder of James and John asking for something really stupid, um, for pride and for um, selfish, self-serving reasons to, to be glorified and to be worshipped in, in heaven. And God, I, I do pray for every student in this room to take very seriously their selfishness, take very seriously their pride, and to say it is a big deal because it is sin against you, and that's not what you've called us to do. You've called us to be selfless and humble disciples, submitting ourselves to the master each and every day, every thought, every action, every conversation. But God, also, that you've called us now to be a servant of other people. So I do pray, God, that every student in this room would take seriously their call to be a servant of others, that we would be a room full of slaves of all, worried more about what other people need and meeting their desires more than our own. So God, thank you so much for this reminder. We pray that we would be less selfish, less prideful, more selfless, and more humble this week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.